good number of ways. So, the Encyclopedia of Life is an online resource of biodiversity information. Our goal is to make information about all organisms, from viruses and plants to birds and, and um, mushrooms, available, openly accessible on the web. And open access means not just that everybody can look at it for free, but also that it is available for redistribution and for reuse in other contexts. That is very important for us. So what we do is we aggregate resources from diverse sources, and we provide it to a single portal with broad participation from diverse contributors and using effective mechanisms of quality control. And I'll tell you a little bit later what those are. Uh, funding for the Encyclopedia of Life was initially provided by a major grant from the McGough and Sloan Foundation. We're headquartered at the Smithsonian, and we also receive significant support from all of these natural history organizations across the world. So if you come to the EO website right now, you will find tax on pages with content for over a million species. Um, so we're covering about half of, um, of diversity. We also have pages for general families, for orders and classes, and so on. And all of the, the text, the media object, like images, videos, sounds, all of the maps, are contributed by 200 or over 200 content partners. And our partners range from Deutsche National History Museums, International Research Consortia, to smaller projects that might focus just on a particular group, taxonomic group, or the geographic region, or a particular ecosystem. So also, a lot of our pages feature links directly to the literature provided by the Biodiversity Heritage Library, or BHL. Who's going to about BHL? Oh. <laughs> well, you need to know about BHL, because what BHL does is they scan the legacy literature of biodiversity. So mostly stuff that's in the, in the public domain is older than the 1920s, but also government things and, and, and other things that, for example, professional societies are willing to put in creative comments. So they scan all of this uh, material, digitize it, and what we then do is we parse all of these scanned pages against our, our names database. And then on every one of our taxon pages, if a name has been mentioned in the scanned literature, we put a link directly to it from the literature tab under the Biodiversity Heritage Library heading. So go to our taxon pages, look in that tab, and you'll see a listing that goes directly to the page in a scanned book or a, or a scanned journal where you can read about the species because it's mentioned right there. So EOL was conceived as a global project. We want to provide access to biodiversity knowledge, not just for English speakers, but for people all over the world that have access to the web. And in order to achieve this, we have partnered with international organizations all over the world. So our global partners usually focus on their particular region, and they do their own content development efforts. But they help us manage information in all kinds of different languages and also to acquire it. So information in all these different languages is also translated and shared between the regional encyclopedias and with the, with the global EOL site. Also, our global partners, they provide their own funding. And so, at, at the moment, our, our efforts to really go global in a big way are still under development. So, so when you go to the EOL site right now, you only find a limited number of languages. But thanks to our partners at Invio, Kanavi, and Yavin, we already have information uh, in Spanish for over 15,000 species. And thanks to our partners at the New Library of Alexandria, for example, we have information in Arabic for over a thousand species. So in addition to being an encyclopedia where people can just look up things, EOL is very much also a social networking site. It's a place where people come, where people congregate to collaborate and to exchange ideas about biodiversity. So for example, all over the site you will find these news feeds where you can see what people are talking about, what people are collaborating on, on the site. For example, we also have these loosely formed in casual communities 
where people can talk about particular projects or have discussions. Uh, for example, here's one where we, we worked on supporting the resources of our biopics. We have um, communities that recruit beta testers, community biodiversity tools and applications, the endless possibilities. Another cool thing that people can do in EOL is build collections. EOL collections are nothing more than just a list of links to EOL materials. This can be a list to just a taxon page. It can be a list to a particular image, a particular video, a particular sound file on, on, on the site, or even to a, a person's profile of a, a registered user or an organization on, on the site. So what people use this for is, of course, to organize EOL content from a personal point of view. For example, we get lots of people that come and make collections of the things that they've seen in their yard, or the things that they grow in their garden, or things that occur in, in their local park. The life is the birds, or the birds that they want to see in the future, all kinds of things like that. Other people build collections to tell stories and share their knowledge. You can, for each um, collection object, you can provide an annotation to, to tell people what you mean by it, or to you tell uh, the story that's associated with it. Also, a lot of people just use collections as scrapbooks to, to create links to materials that they then use for a particular classroom or research project. So, collections are great fun, and looking at other people's collections is great fun, too. Also, on EOL, people are not just limited to consume the content that's provided by scientists. On the site, actually, everybody's invited to contribute content themselves, text, images, media, whatever. For example, on each of our taxon pages in the detail tab where all of, all of the text lives, there is a button up, up here that says add an article to this page. And all you have to do to use it is create a free EOL account. And then whenever you provide text information to EOL, we'll ask you first to specify the subchapter. And for that, you select from a list of 50 topics. We probably still have some work to do to accommodate ethnobotanical content, but you know, provide feedback, help us, and, and put comments on the site so we can develop a subject catalog to meet, to, to meet the, the needs of your community. Other things we want to specify is the language. We accept content in a whole number of, of languages, and we're always interested in expanding our English catalog. There, there's a large number, including a few dialects and things like that. Very important also, you have to specify the license under which your content can be reused. We don't accept our rights reserved, it has to be a Creative Commons license. And then when you enter your text and your references and you save it, it will be on the tax on page immediately. It will appear on that page as soon as you save it. Another thing that this community would be very cool to have help us is to develop our database of common names. We already have several thousand common names in all kinds of different languages, but we, we could use a lot of help as in these especially cool to have more common names for economically significant plans. That would be really nice. If you're interested in contributing videos, sounds, images, um, the easiest way to do that is through one of the popular media sharing sites. So we currently harvest um, media files from Flickr, YouTube, Vimeo, Wikimedia Commons, and SoundCloud. And we have groups on, on some of these. For others, we just basically parse everything that's there and, and pick up things that, that are taxonomically tagged. Um, and through our Flickr group alone, we already have over 100,000 images on EOL, very high quality images, beautiful images that greatly enhance the collection that we get from our scientific partners, which often give us you know, images of, of preserved specimens. So it's great to get all of these live uh, wildlife images from our favorite contributors. So for a project that accepts contributions from so many diverse sources, of course, quality control is a major issue. So the way we address this is that all information that comes to us from scientific sources or projects coordinated by scientists is pre-trusted on the site and gets marked as a, as, as a trusted object. Whereas information that comes from the public, from people we don't know, is marked as unreviewed. So we get this mixed collection of pre-trusted stuff, of stuff that is unreviewed, 
And then we let our community provide the, the quality control. The pre-trusted stuff, it's pre-trusted, but it's still open to debate because scientists make, uh, make mistakes too. So on the site then, you have the site members, registered members, over 50,000 of them. They can participate in quality control by rating things and by commenting on things. But we also have a network of over a thousand professional scientists and naturalists who are registered as curators on the site and who review the information that comes in on the groups that they're interested in. And they actually have the power to trust unreviewed information and also to untrust both unreviewed and previously trusted materials. So everybody can participate, but only the, the curators, which are credential scientists or master naturalists that have accomplishments either through their work in DOL or through their work in, in their own communities, local communities out there, um, can participate too at, at the curator level. And in general, on EOL, trusted information is displayed much more prominently, while unreviewed information, users usually have to drill down a little bit to find it, but it, but it is completely available. So um, if this piques your interest and you want to think about participating in EOL, there's a number of things that you can do. You and your students can add information to EOL pages. You can go to Flickr or YouTube and upload your media files. You can add common names to our pages. You can build EOL collections and participate in our communities, start new communities. Um, if you're a professional scientist, and this includes graduate students, uh, you can become a DOL curator, you sign up, you apply for curator status, we check your credentials, and then um, you will be approved, you can start working. Um, and if you have a lot of information in the database and spreadsheets and PDFs, we, we parse just about anything we can get our hands on, as long as it is applies to summary information about organisms. We don't deal with information about individual specimens, we're interested about summary treatments, that tell you something that they can be regional, but they should be about more than a single specimen, except in, in the case of type specimens, which this community probably doesn't deal so much with. Um, so in that case, you will want to sign up as a data partner with you all. And on our table, just across the hall here, at the base of the stairs, there is a stack of beautiful EOL brochures, but also a handout that describes all of these different ways of contributions and provide links on where you can find more information. Thank you. And I think we should have time for one question. Okay. Is the information sent in signed? Pardon? Is, uh, when, when somebody contributes, is it signed? Yes, yes. So, and, and, and all of our scientific computers have, uh, contributors have to sign with their real name. And the curators also, they have to join with their real name, whereas the general members, they can use pseudonyms, you know, like Ice Cream Social, one, two, three, or something. That's fine. But as soon as you start carrying authority, you have to provide your own. Thank you.